All right. So, Laura, you have finished your first of your historic garments, historic, <laughs> uh, ensembles. So we wanted to talk today about um, specifically the um, 1870s uh, poly back from the skin out. And what I would like to do is talk a little bit about some of the inferences we made and why we made them for depicting a 1870s woman in Indian territory. Um, we're not gonna get really deeply into some of those more personal things, but just to give us a, to give a sense of kind of what the point of the garments are and how, you, how we came to the conclusions and decisions we made, choices we made. Um, so number one, did we get to study extant garments and make decisions based on those? You mean in, per in person? No, yeah, no. no. <laughs> and why? <laughs> So why is that? Is that honestly, when we looked and there, there might be, I'm not going to discount, there might be some extant Cherokee person worn garments from Indian territory that have been saved either in private collections or even possibly at the Museum of the Cherokee Indian or the Eastern Band Museum might have um, pieces from the correct era. But at least for where we live and wh what we had access to, we just didn't have anything individual that we could look at that would kind of fit all those elements and I think it's a really important nuance to make which is you're kind of forced to make emphasis about material culture in marginalized populations anyway there is sort of this academic goal or best practice of studying original pieces but many many people who are interested or even have expertise in their culture don't have access to those things um, that can be a significant barrier to them either because those pieces were never collected or my current theory that I'm going to build out a little bit more in some um, in some more writing is that I think museum collections for American Indian communities tend to focus on exotic or ceremonial pieces or pieces Absolutely. that are very special yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely, you can see, and, and I'm going to interrupt you a little bit here, you can definitely okay. see a bias toward like authenticity or mm -hmm. like capturing, you know, true Indian life. And you see this even in um, one of my like kind of historical pet peeves in photography was this guy named uh, Curtis, Edward Curtis, who was completely obsessed with the idea that Indians were dying yeah. out. The and, nobles, and, capturing the noble yeah. savage before yeah, they all they die. Yeah. Yeah. He took it as like his job to go around and, you know, take photographs of of people, you know, in, in their natural habitat, basically like animals in a zoo. Yeah. And to the point where what's hilarious about it was like, he was completely obsessed with this idea. And even him working as hard as he could to create this fantasy of like the perfect Indian or the, you know, native, you know, Indian. unspoiled savage. Yeah. 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 Like, but, but you can even, if you look at the photos closely enough and what's, what's weird is like as an object, as an art object, the, the, the work he did is incredibly beautiful. It's incredibly gorgeous. And you might think of it as like, okay, this might be the only documentation that these families have of what their ancestors looked like like in terms mm -hmm. of their faces but if you look closely enough you'll notice that you know <laughs> uh, clothes especially are recycled um yeah. he was carrying around a particular buckskin shirt that he really liked that he just kind of put on people um you can see where he went in probably at the negative stage and like scratched things out mm. um, that was kind of early photoshop so like in particular, there's a great photo I love of, a, of where there's these people in their space and on the mantle uh, in the background is a clock and he has tried to erase the clock. Oh, wow. Yeah, but if you look closely enough, you can see that it's still there. So it's this, it's this kind of catch 22 where like we wouldn't have any documentation. Mm -hmm. People looked like it from that time period without work like his. On the other hand, he was also ultimately creating a fantasy of what well, and, and that isn't limited only I want to be fair it's only that's not limited only to native people I, the other day I actually saw a portrait of Davy Crockett in which the um the person writing about it pointed out that that Davy had to borrow these kind of frontierman clothes that they wanted to paint him in 
because he didn't dress like that. <laughs> and so, you know, there was already kind of this mythologizing at the time that we need to remember that that lens is between us and now. So like we have not just the Victorian, like, well, this is the Victorians. We have the Victorians mm -hmm. with their romantic ideas of what it meant to be this tough Westerner, whatever that was. Yeah, the, the, the mythology yeah. of the Wild West. Yeah, the mythology of the Wild West was very, was very popular in all over the world at the time. And, and natives were part of that. And natives having kind of special, a different way they looked was really important. Because also, we'll get into this a little bit later, um, you know, whiteness is fake. And whiteness is predicated on being able to put other people outside of whiteness. And so the more that you're able to say these people are different from us, the more distinct your whiteness is. So ironically, I will say that I'm going to admit that I thought there would be kind of special Cherokee clothes that would be different, especially in this era, that would have persisted because we have, and we'll get to this more later when we talk about the tear dress next time, we have this folk costume that I believed until quite recently was based on a specific garment or a specific you know, series of garments or types of garments. And my assumptions about there being special Cherokee clothes for this era was just obliterated upon contact with actual text. So what we have personally is a little later to the era, we have some photographs of um, our great grandmother, probably at, in her graduation dress. Um, and she's every inch the fashionable lady of her time. And that's a little bit later than this period. But then also we have a couple other family photographs that we found where, again, you couldn't tell, like the person looks like, you know, and they're getting their photograph taken. This is when photographs are still very special, right? So they're, they want to look their very best. They're wearing their very best things. And they look, you, you, couldn't, take, you couldn't throw them into a pile of 40 other women's photos in the era in that same studio and, and have them look any different. Like you couldn't pick them out. Mm -hmm. um but specifically what kind of started to tickle my mind about thinking oh maybe this wouldn't look different is and this is from the writing of James Mooney and bearing in mind James Mooney's also got some grains of salt he also had his own romanticism and so you need to be clear about James Mooney having flaws but to be fair he's one of our best ethnographers he was the first ethnographer <laughs> actually <laughs> he invented the whole field in order to document this group of people that he believed were going to dis to melt into America and disappear. Um, so he had his own romance and his own sense of also justice. He felt like Cherokees had been mistreated. And interestingly, one of his reasons for his sympathy for us, I believe until like this year that he was Cherokee uh, writing in English, turns out he was Irish <laughs> and the, the reason he's buried nearby, I'm going to do, I'm going to try to go visit his grave and, you know, put a rock on it and thank him. Um, because he, because his writing was so, Laura is writing. Remember when we used to go to the Oklahoma when we were kids and like read all these books about Cherokee history, mm -hmm. they were all from him. Like I'm finding these books again, reading them again. I'm like, I read this before when I was 12, like it was all James Mooney. And I presume he was Cherokee because of the things he was writing about. I was wrong, but what's interesting was he was Irish. He had specific sympathy for us, he said, because he himself had been discriminated against as an Irishman mm -hmm. in America. <laughs> so, um, but, so his work is kind of interesting though, because he's writing it down, which makes it, you know, searchable history, but often he's either writing, he's secondhand or thirdhand. He's writing other people's recollections that he took down or, or other people's writings that he's repeating. So he's not, I don't know whether to actually call him a primary source or not, but one specific thing that I really found really interesting was also how Cherokees carried material culture with them when they went to Indian territory. And so he specifically tells us in the spring of 1819, Thomas Nuttall, the naturalist, ascended the Arkansas and he gives an interesting account of the Western Cherokee as he found them at the time. And going up the stream, both banks of the river, as we proceeded, were lined with the houses and farms of the Cherokee. And though their dress was a mixture of indigenous and European taste, yet in their houses, which are decently furnished, and in their farms, which are all well fenced and stocked with cattle, 
we perceive a happy approach towards civilization. Their numerous families, also well-fed and clothed, argue proprietist progress in their, <laughs> hold on, in their population. Their superior industry, either as hunters or farmers, proves the value of property among them. And they are no longer strangers to avarice and the distinctions created by wealth. Some of them are possessed of the property in the amount of many thousands of dollars and have houses handsomely and conveniently furnished, tables spread with our dainties and luxuries. So, you know, to me that he's describing almost to his surprise, uh, a community that is not distinct in material culture from the one that he is from. And these are early settlers who had left um, our homeland um, well in advance of the removal itself. Um, we've also got, as we said, when we look at engravings of, of Cherokee elites, which are almost always men, um, again, these are men who are trying to impress the Americans, but they're showing, they're wearing the exact same things their American peers are wearing, fashionable English or American dress, almost always, unless they're trying to make a big point about being a rugged, you know, you know, independent person, in which case he looks like Davy Crockett, <laughs> uh, with a, you know, with a uh, turban on. Uh, we'll talk about the turban later. That's a much earlier thing. And then also um, there was some really interesting work put out by Yale Priest Museum about Cherokee dress that again, kind of, it, it doesn't look different. Um, so then that kind of made our job easier and harder because we had thought we would have, you know, some really strong guidelines to go with. We didn't end up having that. We ended up kind of having some choices. Uh, we still wanted to base the work um, and the decisions on um, area specific or locality specific probabilities. And in that, in that seeking, a really important resource came to light for us, which was Marna Jean Davis's book, No Lady of Leisure. We'll link that in the description. Um, she, her work is invaluable because to us because it, it, she's basing it on extant garments. She does have access to extant collections usually a little bit later than 1870, but sometimes as early as 1840 that are specifically from Indian territory and kind of, you know, the, the pioneer area, the area where things were, were not as known. It's not Philadelphia. It's area where people are bringing their stuff from, um, from the East Coast or, from, or getting it shipped from other places in the world and using it and wearing it and working in it and living in it in Indian territory and its environs. So her book was really invaluable for some of the decisions we made. But with that, I'm going to uh, mute myself so that the camera will go to you, Laura, because I want you to start doing the tour. And also I need to let my cat in because she's crying at the door. <laughs> All right. So uh, we started with some combinations. So the very first layer is, you know, obviously your base layer that protects your skin from your clothing and your clothing from your skin. And uh, they do, especially your corset, um, it, since you know it could rub, and also um, you you don't necessarily um, wash a corset very much, and so you want a layer in between you and the corset. Um, if it's clear from an image that a person is wearing a corset, they probably do have a shift combinations or some other base layer. Um, at this time period, um, actually, a slightly possibly more common version would be a two-piece garment. So you would have a top kind of layer um, and then uh, usually like a pantaloon uh, that pulled on that was um, a, an open in the crotch area so that you could you know, use the restroom during the day. So so why didn't we do pantaloons? This is we a didn't fun. Do pantaloons. Um, why not? So, so we actually- You don't we, have to for one. You, you don't have to. We did actually, use, so partly like that's also both of our preference. Although I did discover, um, I know you don't do this, but I did discover when I was wearing this to an event that I can wear hip hugger panties um, successfully under under all this stuff. Yeah, you can. They just have to be low. They have to be low yeah. enough. Um, yeah. And honestly, you have, to be, you have to be pretty sure that if you're going to use a bathroom that you have enough space Mm -hmm. to just get all of your skirts up out of the way like that's the other problem if you're going to be using porta potties yeah that's um or or honestly and i've done uh, kneeling uh kneeling over a chamber pot in the back of your car oh you do not want you don't want to have to deal with you everything. do not want any anything in your way yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. so so when like lisa and i both um typically 
it isn't that we run around wearing just skirts and no underwear in everyday life, but um, we, we did both, well, Lisa at least definitely did try. She, she muslined some um, pantaloons and we tried them on a couple of times and they, we just couldn't find a way to make them comfortable. And Lisa yeah. brought up the fact that she had once asked our aunt grandmother um, about her, what, how did this conversation occur? So, you know, I don't know how, they, I don't remember, <laughs> but so, so two things I actually did when I was very beginning in this make a pair of combinations that were split drawers. And I did wear them a couple of times, but I never liked them. And then I remembered once my, my grandmother was telling us about, she, I know what it was. She was trying to give me a pair of pants she had bought that she ended up not liking. And we had very similar hip and tummy areas. So she thought they would fit me, but my thighs were more developed than hers. Mm -hmm. So they didn't, I, I could get into them. But I didn't like them. And she says, well, do you ever wear a girdle? Because she was trying, she was looking through her closet, looking for things that she thought would look nice on me. If only I would wear a girdle in the late nineties. <laughs> and I was like, I don't, no one wears girdles, Nana. I, I can't, I'm not wearing a girdle. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, this is before we were into this stuff it was, I was still wearing, uh, you know, combat boots all the time, unless it was too hot. And then I had sandals on. And, um, so no, I was not going to wear a girdle. And, uh, <laughs> She kind of comments, she kind of reminisced, oh, you know, when I was a kid, um, you know, back in, you know, we, we always just had one petticoat because we didn't, you know, we were poor. And um, I never liked drawers, so I just had my one petticoat. And I, I remember it kind of stuck in my mind is like, I at the time, at the time it didn't, I didn't understand that I meant she wasn't wearing panties. Mm -hmm. but now I realize that's what she was actually telling me it was because she was trying to say oh well, you don't always have to wear everything that everyone wears because like I used to just go with just a petticoat and I remember like kind of not it, you know thinking she was just sort of you know it was a random factoid but it stuck in my mind and then literally as I'm trying on this muslin for these split drawers and hating it I was like wait a minute that's what she was telling me <laughs> like, that in the 1930s her and because she and my mother never liked drawers she said so her mother lived through the period of time in which drawers were pretty according to fashion historians are ubiquitous but apparently our great grandma just could, could not deal with them didn't like them and um our, our nana told us this so now we have this oral history that we had this family family history of not liking drawers <laughs> probably because yeah. they're hard to fit our bodies yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, th I, th I think one of the things that happens, and, and it's possible other people will have had this experience. If you've ever worn a skirt with a backpack where the backpack is hitting your, your back of your hip, and as you walk, what happens? What happens? Slowly, the skirt your, gets your skirt gets rocked up. Yeah. And, and, and imagine how much worse that would be if you had something that at least met under your legs, met under your body. Um, and then you had on other layers of, of clothing that, that hit your high hip. Um, and then as you move around, imagine what's happening. Like it's definitely not comfortable. So, so anyway, so we basically were our base layer, our bottom layer, or my bottom layer is, is literally just basically a, what we now would maybe even just wear as a dress. A lot of people would wear this garment as just a dress. And, and actually I have worn that garment as a dress. <laughs> Yeah. So it's it's a combinations, but it's a skirt combination. So it's a petticoat. It's it's also could be called a bodice petticoat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a petticoat with a little with a essentially a little sleeveless bodice underneath. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's very comfortable. And what's what's funny, and I don't, I don't know if I'll be able to show this in the video or if I'll be a little more modest, but uh, when I'm not wearing the corset, I can button it all the way up to the top. Um, and then I kind of know when the corset is giving my bust the correct shape because the little itty teeny buttons on the combination <laughs> pop open. Kind of pop out uh, of it. Yeah, it's bust funny. Lifted, there just isn't enough room uh, for everything that I need to have in that part of my chest area to be held. hilarious. So that's how I know. It's like, okay, once the buttons come off, then I, or they don't come off, but once the buttons open, <laughs> they open. And in my yeah. defense, they are extremely They're tiny. They're really tiny. But yeah. So well, they're lingerie, it's lingerie, they're lingerie buttons, they're very small, yeah. like, yep. they're not even, I don't think they're even quarter inch buttons, they're really tiny buttons, mm -hmm. so, so, yeah. so that's the base layer, and, and, and as Laura said, the reason we know for sure that everyone has that is, despite the way that historical fiction has lied to you, 
you just can't bear a corset without something protecting you. And the corset won't last very long Mm -hmm. without protection from you. And so if you're looking at someone in a photograph who's, you know, bust, waist and hip smoothness suggests they have some kind of support garment on, even though you you will not be able to see it because of course they didn't want you to see it. They have a shift or combinations or, you know, a chemise, they have something on. You can't, you're not just going to go bare skin to corset on despite what, you know, <laughs> sexy pirate movies have shown you. So that's not true. Yeah. So, so there's, so there's that. Hello, little kitty.